tonight on Nate Newswatch. Appointments for both COVID-19 and influenza will soon begin in Alberta. Find out how you can keep yourself safe. Definitely once the flu shots are out on October 16th, you could get your COVID shot done at the same time. Nate is front and center for new 5G technologies. This is the kind of technology that you use every day. And Nate culinary art students have something to offer for the annual Boyle Street Thanksgiving dinner. We like to volunteer our time. We like to, uh, to be involved in, in some of these things. Newswatch starts now. Good evening. Multiple provinces across Canada received an increase in their minimum wages this year, but not here in Alberta. With low wages and rising inflation being an ongoing issue in the province, minimum wage workers are shocked to see that it is staying at $15 per hour. Hit workers across the province are speaking out about the issue, especially those who are living on their own and balancing post-secondary education and bills. Abby Cunningham joins us live from the Nate Hallways with more on that story. Thanks, Christine. With six provinces and territories across the country increasing their minimum wage this month and three others increasing it earlier this year, Alberta is left with ours remaining the same. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Five years ago, Alberta's minimum wage was the highest in the country. But since then, the government has made no change and we're now in the bottom three. With inflation going up along with the cost of living, $15 an hour just isn't cutting it anymore for many Albertans. They haven't increased the minimum wage for five years. In that time, uh, inflation has gone up nearly 20%. This inflation jump is the largest Alberta has seen in over 40 years. Minimum wage workers across Alberta are struggling to make ends meet as the cost of living continues to increase. Do you want to do a cup or coke for that one? Danielle McClements is a Nate student living in Edmonton on her own, having to pay for her own rent, groceries and bills, all while attending classes. To be honest, I don't get out much, like I don't do much other than work, school, go home, repeat. I'd probably spend about 70% of my paycheck on paying to live. A statement released by Andrea Smith states that maintaining the current minimum wage gives employers and employees predictability and stability during a time of economic growth and labor shortages. Stability in a time of rising costs and high inflation uh, is the op opposite of what we need in terms of wages because, you know, I think everyone understands that a wage uh, that remains stable uh, while prices are going up is actually a wage cut. According to McGowan, 65% of our economy is driven by consumer spending. So if people have less money to spend, then it doesn't hurt just the individual workers, but also the overall economy. If you look at difference in like something as simple as a carton of eggs compared to five years ago, it's a huge difference and our wages are the same. And I think that's kind of terrible. The government of Alberta is not planning on increasing the minimum wage anytime soon, choosing to leave it at $15 per hour. So Abby, since they're not increasing it, what can students do to survive on a low income and still be in school? So the biggest thing that students can do is to plan where their money is going with each paycheck and cut back on things that aren't deemed as essential. Budgeting plans are a useful tool to help figure out where you can split up your money as each paycheck comes in, choosing what's going to go to groceries, what's going to go to bills, and what might go to fun if you can have some extra money for it. Also, Nate does have a campus food bank, so if you're short on money and can't afford to get groceries one week, that's a super helpful tool right here on campus. And then lastly, uh, applying for scholarships, bursaries, grants, student loans, any of that kind of financial stuff can really help as the financial aid you might need. And if possible, and you are able to live at home with family, that in the end can usually be the cheapest option. How high is the cost of living now? And how much would the average student have to earn to do more than just survive? So according to the Alberta Living Wage Network, you need to make around $22 an hour to live comfortably in Edmonton or Calgary. So even if our minimum wage was raised to $17.70 with inflation, as Gil McGowan mentioned, it's still not considered to be a livable wage. 
The biggest difference between the two being that minimum wage is the lowest you can be paid by an employer to make sure that you're getting paid fairly for your labor, whereas the livable wage is calculated by how much a person needs to be making per hour to cover basic needs and expenses to live comfortably. Thanks, Abby. That was Abby Cunningham reporting live from the Nate Hallways. You're watching Nate News Watch, the next generation of news. After five years in the making, Nate and Rogers have finally launched their 5G-enabled test environments on Nate's campus. <laughs> the use of 5G at Nate will allow for more efficient and productive technology, as well as being a small step towards having 5G workplaces across not only Alberta, but all of Canada. This is the kind of technology that you use every day with your smart devices. Now, what we've lacked in Canada is industry enablement of 5G, private LTE, and also we've lacked reaching rural areas. The test environments will allow for testing and validating of many different industry applications and can help in remote surgeries, advanced manufacturing. COVID-19 numbers are climbing and flu season has arrived, so COVID-19 and flu vaccines are here to combat the spread. Cold and flu medicine as COVID-19 testing kits line the shelves as flu season begins. However, vaccines are still the best way to avoid catching the flu or COVID-19 and they are now available to get. Definitely, so you could take both of those together. Uh, that's actually what the AHS is recommending. Uh, so that's kind of why it lined up that way too. Uh, so COVID vaccine is currently available. It's just stock is a little tricky getting a hold of. You can visit your local pharmacy to make an appointment or book one online at bookvaccine.alberta.ca. With COVID-19 not being as prevalent in today's world, the effects of the pandemic are still being felt with many jobs facing staff shortages. One of these jobs facing staff shortages are veterinarians. I knew I wanted to work with animals. Veterinary clinics are facing one of their biggest shortage crises in recent times, with a huge de decrease in people working the profession. This decrease is thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused a lot of vets to lose their jobs, along with creating a spike in pet sales, which overwhelmed veterinary clinics still open during the pandemic. Multifactorial as to why it happened. So we have increased pet ownership over the past few years. So a lot of people, because they were home, um, they decided to get pets at that point. Especially over the past you know, five years, we've been seeing a lot more um, veterinary burnout. Um, so vets leaving the profession for a number of reasons. The increase of vet burnouts plus the current shortage crisis makes veterinary work in demand. Organizations such as Not One More Vet have been created to promote veterinary mental health and help the industry in this shortage crisis. Nay culinary students are continuing to give to the community with their annual Thanksgiving Boyle Street donation. Nay culinary students have a lot on their plate when preparing turkey dinners for all the homeless people at Boyle Street, from cooking the meat to cutting the vegetables and making stuffing. But it's worth it to be part of a good cause. As cooks, this is something that we do. We give back to the community, uh, you know, and, and fairly often. We like to uh, we like to volunteer our time. We like to uh, to be involved in in some of these things. After three and a half hours of cooking, there was enough food to feed 800 hungry people this Thanksgiving. Right after the break, we'll see how the U of A Golden Bears and Pandas are preparing for this season. We'll also take a look at what the Nate Ooks are up to. And for this question of the week, we asked Nate students around campus how they feel about Alberta's minimum wage. This week on Nate News Watch, we hang out with the Ooks golf team before heading to U of A to get ready for Hoops Fest and hang out with some high pedigree players on the men's volleyball team. Before finally, we get ready for the season opener for the women's volleyball team here in the Nate Gymnasium. All that and more coming up. Hi, I'm Jana Humamil, and despite it being chilly, the weather is still looking good this weekend with higher than average temperatures. But more of that coming up in weather. A look at the high-level bridge in Edmonton this week lit up white and blue in support of those suffering in Israel and the Middle East. 
Christine, have you noticed that the weather has gotten a lot cooler recently? I have, but I don't think that's going to stop anyone from enjoying the weekend outdoors. I'm sure our own Janai Umalmil has more details about the weather. Thanks guys, the weather is looking good this weekend despite it being a little colder. There will be no rains and it won't be as windy as, as it was earlier this week. And if you have nothing to do tomorrow, something exciting is coming up for you. But before that, let's take a look at Calgary. So it is going to be partly cloudy throughout the whole weekend and if you are going out Sunday afternoon, it is going to be a bit warmer, closer to 18 degrees. Completely different if we head on to Jasper, if you're leaving tomorrow morning, Bundle up, it is going to be minus one. And if you are leaving Sunday morning, prepare yourself. It won't rain, but there is a chance of morning rain. And on to Fort McMurray. It is going to be sunny on Saturday with an afternoon high of 15 for tomorrow and Sunday as well. On to Edmonton, we also have clear skies and it is going to be mainly sunny tomorrow. And there is going to be a partial solar eclipse happening tomorrow morning between 9 a.m. and 12. If you're interested to see this, you can head on to the TELUS World of Science where they will let you watch this for sa safely and free. And on to the Edmonton average high and low. As you can see, we are above average this weekend and the Edmonton record high was 28 in 1945, almost double of what we have this weekend. And the record low was minus 11 in 1886. So it is a colder weekend, but it's nothing to, to worry about. So go out, enjoy the weather. And once again, if you're interested, you can watch the solar eclipse at the TELUS World of Science. This was Jana Humamu with your weather. Newswatch Weather is brought to you by NR92, the station for the students. It's been five years since Alberta increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and it hasn't changed since. Six provinces in Canada have already increased theirs, bringing Alberta closer to the bottom in the ranks. For this question of the week, we partnered up with the Nate Nugget to ask Nate students how they feel about the current minimum wage in Alberta. Hi, I'm Miros. I'm with the Nugget. They will be asking Nate students how they feel about minimum wage in Alberta. We haven't been able to keep up with the prices and it's just, it's not, it's not a livable wage anymore. It used to be, but since all the prices have gone up, it's just, things are getting more and more expensive now that we can't keep up with it. And, I would be totally cool with a higher minimum wage because even like even like 20 bucks an hour like is barely enough to live off right now. Everything's so expensive. I feel like it's lacking in what we all need at the moment due to the inflation that the government is placing on all items needed to survive. It's no longer getting us as far as we should to be able to live comfortably. I'm Miros with The Nugget. Thanks for watching. The excitement around college sports is ramping up as teams around the city have started getting to the flow of things. That's right. Here's Tristan Johnson to give us the scoop on the latest of the Ukes and more. Thanks, guys. Temperatures in Edmonton are getting cooler, but the Nate golf team is out facing the cold. It's their first year back since 2014, and they're looking to add some national hardware to their trophy case. Our Ben Lowan has more on the reinstated team pushing for the championship. This is Mason Gorski. He's one of seven athletes preparing to represent Nate as CCAA Nationals. Mason is also a setter on the men's volleyball team with ACAC Player of the Year credits to his honor. Finding time for everything can be difficult for student athletes, but it can become near impossible when playing for two. Six of the 12 athletes on the roster play two sports at Nate, and being a dual student athlete can sometimes feel like a juggling act. It's a new experience for me, definitely. It's been a tough, it's been tough kind of balancing both, but in the end of the day, I get to do two things I love. It makes school just that much more enjoyable for me. I know both teams are supporting me each and every way. It's a really great experience so far. In its first year back since 2014, the Nate golf team has been turning heads and making history. During the ACAC championships in Red Deer, Michaela Kibblewhite was eighth place after round one, but was able to climb up to fifth after rounds two and three to earn a spot at nationals. The men's team had a similar story. Sitting in fourth after two rounds, they clawed their way into a national spot, edging the Medicine Hat Rattlers by one stroke. With this triumph, the group showed they could overcome adversity. Our ACAC championships was, it was a tough start definitely for some of us, but then it was also, 
a great ending. Lots of our guys shot their best tournament scores this year. So, I mean, it was a really great ending to what we had. And then to be able to make nationals, I mean, everyone was super excited, including myself. The conference also gave awards to two of NACE members. Michaela Kibblewhite earned all ACAC honors, while head coach Tyler Light was named ACAC Coach of the Year. With the talent this group has, Light is excited to see what his team can do on the big stage. I think it's honestly just going to be a big experience and growth weekend for us. We've never been to a CCAA Nationals before, so kind of see what that landscape looks like and where we stack up and then to try and improve year over year. The championships take place October 16th to 20th in Quebec City. Streaming information can be found on the CCAA website. The 2023-24 Ooks women's volleyball team is getting ready to start off their season strong with their season opener just around the corner. And the Ooks are well on their way to a 3-0 sweep. And that'll help them as they get another ace from Birkenshaw. With only five players returning from last year's squad, head coach Armenia Russo-Thorpe hopes to develop her young talent into stars this season after finishing with only a 3-16 record in last year's campaign. We've got a roster that's a mix of veteran and a, and a mix of our first year to Nate, so it's going to be exciting to see how they come together and, and form a team. The women's volleyball team will be playing their home opener October 20th at the Nate Gymnasium as they take on the Concordia Thunder, a team they lost twice to last season. The team hopes to capitalize on last year's home momentum with all three of their wins coming in home games. The University of Alberta men's volleyball team is on the hunt for a second consecutive Canada West title. The team is leaning on experience to help get the job done once again. Here's Ben Lawan. Energy was high at the Savile Centre Tuesday as the Golden Bears hit the practice courts in preparation for conference play. Last season, the team finished 36-7 and won the 2022 Canada West title. This win gave them a spot in the U Sport Championships where they would finish fourth. This season, the Golden Bears are without three key players, outside hitter Jordan Canham, setter Cam Kern, and libero Landon Curry. Even with the departures, head coach Brock David Duck is excited to see what this year's team can do. This group is really strong with culture and really is, is um, definitely all on the same page. So the, the group uh, reconnected really quickly and there's been a lot of guys chomping at the bit to have their turn to compete for a starting spot. So with uh, you know, some of our guys moving on and, and, and starting spots opening up, there is some really exciting things happening on the court. Seven of 17 athletes this season have spent time playing with the national team. And with so much talent in one gym, players are pushing each other to become better. Yeah, it's amazing. It almost feels like a national team like culture here. All the boys are trying to strive to be on that Team Canada team and wearing that jersey because it all means so much to us. So yeah, getting to practice in that every day is an amazing experience. Outside hitters Jacob Sargent and Isaac Hesslinger were members of Team Canada that competed in the 2023 Norseka Men's Final Six Tournament in Edmonton. Hesslinger was team captain and Canada's top scorer. Now, Isaac's looking to take his skills he's learned and apply them with the Bears. One thing that I learned just uh, with this uh, this past weekend, this past week, was just leading by example and going for every single ball, not letting anything drop, and just yeah, hard work because people take that and they're able to learn from that. The Golden Bears will conclude their preseason in the Queen's Cup October 13th to 15th, and then they will come play at home to open Canada West play October 20th against Thompson River University. For Enzo Sports, I'm Ben Lowan. The University of Alberta Pandas hosted their annual women's basketball tournament last Friday as part of Hoops Fest, a three-day basketball competition with eight competing university teams. <laughs> Hoops Fest is the first basketball event of the season for the Pandas and offers a preview of the competing teams for the coming season, as well as offering valuable experience for the players in their first games of the year. Come out and watch the games. Uh, just see some of the top teams in the country and just sense, get a sense of what the next level basketball looks like. This early tournament experience helps prepare the rookies for this season, with the Pandas having three first-year players on the roster. The Pandas' first season game will come November 3rd when they take on Saskatchewan Huskies as they look to compete at the Women's Basketball Nationals in March. So good to hear from our college teams, but additionally, the Edmonton Elks have announced that they will be closing the Upper Bowl at Commonwealth Stadium for the 2024 season. I guess I won't be hiding in the Upper Bowl anymore. 
true, but I'm excited to see the improved crowd atmosphere from the lower bowl seats. And it should showcase more fans on TV attending games. Coming up, we light things up with a one-of-a-kind fundraiser here in Edmonton. And if you're looking for things to do this Halloween, you might just have the place for you. Speaking of Halloween, we will also be showing you how you can make your very own spooky Halloween costume. I wouldn't costume. be able to make a very good prop if I wasn't interested in it. Oh, I'm Avery Irvine and I'm really feeling the spooks here at Edmonton for their 10th anniversary. Not only that, but we'll be talking about a new fund for Edmonton's film and television industry. More on that coming up in entertainment. Stay tuned. May 2023 team jackets are brought to you by Refined RX Medical Aesthetics and Invincible Team Financial Group. Christine, do you like dressing up for Halloween? Yes, Brennan. As a matter of fact, I love to, but I'm not sure what to be. Well, if you like to get creative, maybe you should make your own costume this year. Our Elijah Nadegal has more on this week's Try This segment. your favorite scary movie. Aha, uh -huh, very funny. Who is this? Well, I think you know who this is. How's the view out there, Elijah? Dude, it's not even Halloween yet. What is this, dude? This is a prepackaged costume? What are we doing, bro? You don't have to be like this guy. With a little bit of creativity, some practice, and advice from some cosplayers, you'll be making your own costume in no time. This one is the uh, Deku Shrub mask. With Halloween right around the corner, you may want to put on a costume and join in the festivities as your favorite character. Whether you're a seasoned crafting pro, a savvy thrifter, or just have a big imagination, there's plenty of ways to get involved with making your own costume. I went to talk to a local cosplayer to get some tips on where exactly to start. The majority of the places that you can get patterns from, uh, from small businesses, they also have YouTube videos and stuff. I don't really believe in the part of kind of starting small with that stuff. If you are really interested in that specific thing, just try and make it. It's helpful to know your strengths and weaknesses when making a costume. And sewing, it is not one of my strengths. Thrifting, however, now that's something I'm good at. Now my skateboarding may still need a little work, but I think my Marty McFly costume is a great blast from the past. Elijah Knox Gull, Nate News Watch. You know what, Christine? I've always wanted to be in a video game. Well, good news. Our entertainment host has more about a $4 million fund for the screen industry in Edmonton, which means you can make a video game that you could star in. Really? That's amazing. Well, let's hear more about it from our Avery Irvine. Thanks, guys. Before, when wanting to go into the entertainment industry, we thought we had to go to Hollywood to follow our dreams. Now, Edmontonians interested in going into the film, television, or even video game industry won't have to look too far from home. Meet Tom Vinica, the CEO of Edmonton Screen Industries Office, also known as ESIO. The ESIO is a not-for-profit company that's in place to help develop the screen industry in Edmonton. With the help of the city, the ESIO introduced a new fund with many programs aimed at and for screen content creators. We had a $4 million fund that was called the Edmonton Screen Media Fund. And uh, earlier this year, we got approval from the city to repurpose that fund or to, uh, to change some of the things that we can do with it. Um, so now we can use it for education, we can use it for infrastructure, we can use it for um, pr like directly investing into projects. The Strategic Initiatives Fund, or SIF, currently has three programs announced. The Elevation Program, early stage program, and the underrepresented initiatives program, which is currently open for applications. With some more programs in development, some people have already begun expressing their excitement and interest in starting projects. It's almost the end of this year, but it's the beginning of a new era for Dedmonton. 
Celebrating their 10 years of fear, they've upgraded their haunted houses as well as where they host them. We get to take a look inside to see what's new. Everything's new because we moved locations this year. So we're in the old Edmonton Sun building now. Uh, we moved right after last season was over. So the location three times as big as our old location plus the outside area is bigger. We added a third haunted house this year. For the third show that we added on this year, we paid homage to the Edmonton Sun and we called the, the show The Print Show. So it's about a murderous murderer upstairs in the old Edmonton Sun building. So we even have some good like newspaper props and that kind of stuff. And then we, we went back to the Williams Farm for the 10th year anniversary and that's where we started in year one. <laughs> Year one, we were in a very small warehouse behind Grant McEwen, and the theme was called the Williams Farm. Um, so we built a haunted house that was like a farmhouse. In year two, we made a movie about the Williams Farm because we moved to the Paramount Theatre. So that year was called The Curse of the Williams Farm. It's quite big this year. It's a lot bigger than year one was. Tons to do. Um, besides the three haunted houses, we have a food truck, we have a concession that sells mini donuts and popcorn and adult drinks. So we have some beers and we have some very creative cocktails. We also have a huge photo op alley this year, which is new. So you can go around with the props and, and take photos and stuff like that. And there's tons of actors uh, looking to scare you while you're doing that. <laughs> The Mutart Conservatory was buzzing this past weekend when each of its pyramids were brought to life during a sonic music experience. The Brian Webb Dance Company held a fundraiser called Flora Sonic where they brought people together through music, movement and nature. Using three of the Mutart's pyramids, arid, temperate and tropical, it made for a unique auditory experience for everyone attending. This is going to be a wild music experience. People are going to experience three different groups of contemporary music makers. One of them, Gary James Joins, he is going to take the group of people meeting here tonight on a fantastic musical journey in the Arid Pyramid. Being Edmonton's oldest contemporary dance company, the BWDC was excited to offer a new and different type of music and fundraising experience. So guys, what are you guys' plans for uh, Halloween this year? Thinking maybe go to one of Edmonton's haunted houses? Haunted houses. Maybe. I think I'll give it a try, but if I go, I'll have to make my own costume first. I'll, I'll try what Elijah did. Mm. I think I might skip out on Halloween this year, work on being in that video game. Nice. Thanks, Avery. And that concludes this week's episode of Nate News Watch. Thanks for joining us. Christine, do you have any plans for this Friday the 13th? Nah, I'm not going to do much this weekend. But I hope you, you have a great weekend, everybody. See ya.